We're diving into some source material you shared with us today, an article called Beta Hedging by Quantitativo Quant Trading Rules. Yeah, this one looks interesting. It gets right into the practical side of things. It does. It explores a specific way to manage risk in trading strategies. The core idea is beta hedging, basically trying to make a portfolio less sensitive to what the overall market is doing. Uh -huh. Reducing that systematic risk. Exactly. And you sent us this article, so our mission here is to really dig into why you do this, how this author actually did it in their example, what the results look like. And crucially, what were the catches? Any potential downsides? That's always important. Absolutely. And, you know, it connects back to fundamental principles. People like William Sharp always stressed risk management. It's not just about chasing returns. It's integral. This article seems like a case study in that. Right. So we'll look at where they started this portfolio that was doing okay, but maybe had too much market exposure. Yeah, the promising portfolio with a catch scenario. Then the solution they tried, the beta hedging itself, how they did it step by step. The theory and the practice. What happened afterwards, the results? Did it work? And what that tells us about, you know, separating the strategy's actual skill from just riding the market wave. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so the source kicks off describing this portfolio, mean reversion strategies, apparently trading live for about six months. And the performance looked pretty good on the surface. Yeah, it showed a plus 10.1% return. And this was during a time when the S&P 500 was actually down 2.8%. So... Nice outperformance there. Definitely catches the eye. Looking at their stats, the sharp ratio was 1.1. The author just says, okay for that, using their own benchmark. Okay, so decent risk-adjusted return by their measure. But here's the flag they raised, the correlation to the S&P 500. It was 0.57. They called that moderately high. Ah, uh, okay. And there's the rub, 0.57 correlation. That means a fair bit of its daily ups and downs were just tracking the market. Right. Not entirely independent. And to dig into that, they use the Fama French three-factor model, which is pretty standard for this kind of analysis. Can you quickly recap what that model does? Sure. It basically tries to explain a portfolio's returns based on its exposure to three main known risk factors. First, the overall market risk, how sensitive it is to the market as a whole. That's the beta, often called MKTRF. Second, the size factor, or SMB, small minus big. Does it behave more like small cap stocks or large cap stocks? Got it. And third, the value factor, HML high minus low. Does it lean towards value stocks or growth stocks? The model then sees how much of the return is explained by these factors. And whatever's left over is the alpha, the unexplained return, hopefully due to the strategy's skill. Okay, so what did the Fama French analysis show before they started hedging? Well, the good news first. They found a statistically significant alpha. When annualized, it came out to about 14.4%. So that suggests the strategy itself did have some genuine edge. That's pretty solid. But, and this is the key part for the hedging discussion, the market beta, the MKTRF loading, was 0.57, also highly significant. Matching that correlation number we saw earlier. Exactly. It confirms that sensitivity. They also noted a slight tilt towards small caps, the SMB factor, and a negative loading on HML, meaning it tilted away from value, maybe towards growth. Mm. But really... The 0.57 market beta was the main story in terms of factor exposure. So summing up the problem, promising alpha, suggesting the core strategy works, but a big chunk of the day-to-day -day is just driven by market moves because of that 0.57 beta. Precisely. It's yeah. catching market updrafts, but also vulnerable to market downdrafts. That's the systematic risk they wanted to tackle. And the goal, stated in the article, was to hedge that market exposure, right? Try to strip it away. Yeah, to neutralize that beta. The idea is if you can do that, you isolate the strategy's own performance of the alpha. And a potential side benefit is reducing those big drawdowns that happen just because the whole market sold off. Makes sense. You want to know if your strategy sinks or swims on its own merits, not just because the tide went out? Okay, theory time. If that's the problem, how does this beta hedging actually work? What's the strategy they used? The core concept is pretty straightforward, really. 
If your portfolio has a beta of 0.57, meaning it tends to move 0.57% for every 1% the market move, you need an offsetting position. So you take a short position in something that tracks the market. In this case, they used S&P 500 futures, the ES contract. Okay, shorting the market to cancel out the long exposure from the portfolio's beta. Right. You size that short position proportionally. The aim is to get the combined position your original portfolio plus the short futures hedge to have a net beta close to zero. So if the market goes up 1%, the portfolio gains from its beta, but the short futures lose roughly the same amount, canceling the market effect. That's the ideal, yeah. Leaving you hopefully with just the alpha generated by the underlying mean reversion trade. But how do you manage that? Portfolio value changes, beta isn't perfectly stable. Good point, and that's why it has to be dynamic. They state that the hedge needs to be recalculated and adjusted daily. Both the portfolio's value and its estimated beta fluctuate, so the size of that short ES position needs to change day to day to keep the net beta near zero over time. A daily adjustment. Okay. And they were just focused on market beta, MKT-RF, not the size or value factors. For this specific example, yes. Just market beta. They did mention you could apply the same logic to hedge other factors, estimate the loading, find a proxy, size the hedge. But here they kept it simple, focusing only on the most significant exposure. Got it. So let's get into the implementation details. The source shared some code logic. How did that translate theory into practice? Okay, yeah, they broke down the steps. First, you need the inputs for each day. The portfolio's percentage return, its total dollar value, and the closing price of the ES futures contract. Simple enough data points. Then, the crucial step, estimating the current beta. They used a rolling window specifically, a 63-day look back on daily returns, to run a regression against the market and estimate that beta. 63 days, so about a trading quarter. Roughly, yeah. But then, to avoid reacting too much to short-term noise in that estimate, they smoothed it out using a 20-day exponential moving average, an EMA. Okay, so a smoothed rolling estimate of beta. Any particular reason given for those specific numbers, 63 and 20? The article doesn't deeply justify those exact numbers versus, say, 60 and 15. It's often a mix of convention, backtesting, or trying to balance responsiveness with stability. The key is they're getting a dynamic, smoothed estimate of beta each day. It's a common approach, though you could certainly test sensitivity to those parameters. Fair enough. So they have their daily beta estimate. How do they calculate the hedge size, the number of contracts? Right, this involves the portfolio's total value, that smooth beta estimate, and importantly, something they call a dampening beta factor. They set this factor to 0.5. Hold on, 0.5. So they aren't trying to hedge 100% of the beta they just estimated. Exactly. That's a really key detail. They are deliberately sizing the hedge to offset only half of the estimated beta exposure. Why would they do that? Why not aim for zero beta? The source suggests a couple of reasons. It might improve the overall sharp ratio compared to a full hedge. Or maybe it helps avoid problems like overhedging if the beta estimate isn't perfect or reduces transaction costs from chasing perfect neutrality every single day. It's a pragmatic choice to reduce beta significantly, but not necessarily eliminate it entirely. Interesting. So reduce, don't eliminate. How does the calculation finish? They take the portfolio value, multiply by the smooth beta, multiply by that 0.5 dampening factor, then divide by the value of one ES contract, which involves its price and the multiplier, typically 50 for ES. That gives the theoretical number of contracts. They round it to the nearest whole number, since you can't trade fractions of futures contract, and then they make it negative because it's a short position. Okay, that gives them the target number of short ES contracts for the day. Then how do they track the performance? They simulate the daily P&L, the profit or loss, from that futures position. This is based on the change in the ES futures price from one day to the next, multiplied by the number of contracts they were holding based on the previous day's calculation. Remember, the adjustment happens based on yesterday's info for today's P&L. Ah, okay, because you decide the hedge size at the end of day T, and it impacts performance between day T and day T plus one. Exactly. Then they take that daily futures P&L and simply add it to the original portfolio's daily P&L, its value change. That gives the combined value of the hedged portfolio. And the percentage change of that combined value is your hedged return series. Precisely. That's the process they outlined. All right, quite a detailed process. Rolling beta, smoothing, that 0.5 dampening factor, daily rebalancing. So it's the big question. After running this simulation, what did the results actually show? Did it work? Well, based on the numbers presented in the source, yes, it seems to have achieved its main goal pretty effectively. Let's hear them. What was the impact on market exposure? That's the headline result. 
The correlation to the S&P 500 dropped significantly. Remember, it started at 0.57. A moderately high. After hedging, it fell to 0.29. So they nearly cut the market correlation in half. That's a direct measure of reducing systematic risk. Okay, that's a definite win on the primary objective. What about other metrics, like sharp ratio? That stayed remarkably stable. It went from 1.09 pre-hedge to 1.08 post-hedge, basically unchanged. So hedging didn't really hurt the risk-adjusted performance? Apparently not, according to this result, which is good. You don't want the cost of hedging to outweigh the benefit. What about overall return and volatility? Both decreased slightly which kind of makes sense if you're reducing exposure to the market, which was slightly down overall in their period, but generally provides risk premium. Annualized return went from 21.0% down to 19.8%. Okay, a small drop. And annualized volatility also decreased from 19.1% down to 18.2%. Again, a slight reduction consistent with lower market sensitivity. Less beta, less overall movement, up or down. Makes sense. But now here's the metric that raises an eyebrow and points to that potential downside we talked about, the mm -hmm. maximum drawdown. It actually got slightly worse. It went from 24.4% pre-hedge to the negative 26.0% post-hedge. Whoa, hang on. The drawdown increase, that feels totally backwards. You add a hedge to reduce risk and the worst dip gets deeper. How did the source explain that? Yeah, it's counterintuitive at first glance. The article does touch on this. They suggest this slight increase in the max drawdown might be a consequence of the hedging mechanics themselves. Like what? like the friction or costs associated with that daily rebalancing of the futures hedge. Even if you model commissions as zero, there can be tiny tracking errors, maybe brief moments where the hedge doesn't perfectly offset the portfolio's move due to timing or small discrepancies, or maybe basis risk between the futures and the actual portfolio components. These little imperfections, especially during stressed market periods, which often drive max drawdowns, could potentially accumulate to make the trough slightly deeper. So the act of hedging itself introduces a different, perhaps smaller type of risk or cost, implementation friction. That seems to be the implication. It reduced the big systematic risk, but maybe added some small scale noise or cost in the process. It's a potential downside to be aware of with active hedging like this. Okay, that's a really important nuance. So. Despite that slightly worse drawdown, what was the overall verdict from the source? They still viewed it positively overall. They emphasized that the strategy preserved almost all of its long-term return, despite the hedging and the slight drawdown increase. They took this as reinforcing the idea that there was genuine alpha there, independent of the market. And did they look at the Fama French factors again after hedging? They did. And this is where it gets really interesting, confirming the hedging impact and that alpha story. What did they find? Okay, first... The market beta, MKTRF, as mm -hmm. you'd expect, it dropped massively from 0.57 pre-hedge down to 0.27 post-hedge. Directly confirming the hedge worked in reducing market sensitivity, matching that correlation drop we saw. Remember that 0.5 dampening factor? A beta drop from 0.57 to 0.27 is pretty much exactly having it. Yeah, that lines up perfectly. Okay, what about the alpha? This is the surprising part. The annualized alpha actually increased. It went from 14.4% pre-hedge up to 16.4% post-hedge. It went up. How does that work? You hedge away market exposure and the strategy's apparent skill increases. I know, right? The interpretation offered in the source is that by removing a large part of the market noise, the beta exposure, the model could see the strategy's underlying performance, its idiosyncratic edge, more clearly. Stripping away the market confusion actually revealed a slightly stronger alpha signal. Wow. So the market exposure was kind of masking the full extent of the alpha before. That's one way to look at it, yeah. And consistent with that, look at the R-squared of the Fama French model. R-squared tells us how much of the return variation the model explains, right? Exactly. Before hedging, the R-squared was 0.33. So the three factors explained about a third of the portfolio's daily movements. Okay. After hedging, the R-squared plummeted to just 0 0.09. Wow, from 33% down to 9%. Yeah. So now the standard market size and value factors explain less than 10% of the hedge portfolio's behavior. Most of its movement is now attributed to that alpha term, the strategy-specific stuff. It became much more factor-neutral, especially regarding the market. That's a pretty dramatic shift. It really emphasizes how much of the original portfolio's character was tied to the market factor. Definitely. And importantly, the alpha remained highly statistically significant in both cases. So it wasn't just a fluke. The edge seems robust. And they included a chart, right, at our plot? Yes, comparing the portfolio's daily returns against the S&P 500's returns. Before hedging, you saw a clear upward sloping cloud of points, reflecting that 0.57 beta in correlation. After hedging, 
the plot showed the cloud tightening up considerably and becoming much flatter, visually confirming that slope dropping down towards the 0.27 beta, less dependence on the market's direction. That visual makes it pretty clear. Okay, let's try and synthesize this. We looked at the source you shared, detailing a practical beta hedge. Started with a mean version portfolio, good returns, but linked to the market with a 0.57 beta and correlation. They implemented a daily hedge using short ES futures, but crucially used a 0.5 dampening factor, only targeting half the beta. The results showed it worked. Beta and correlation nearly halved. Sharpie ratio held steady. Returns and vol dipped slightly, as expected. But the max drawdown got slightly worse, potentially due to the friction of daily rebalancing a key potential downside to note. And the really fascinating part from the Fama French was the alpha increasing post hedge from 14.4% to 16.4%, while the R squared crashed from 0.33 to 0.09. Suggesting the hedge successfully isolated the strategy's true performance from market noise, maybe even revealing it more clearly. So overall, a demonstration that even simple beta hedging can significantly change a portfolio's risk profile and help understand its true source of returns. Absolutely. And it's worth remembering this was framed as a simple example. Fixed dampening factor, only hedging market beta. But the principle applies more broadly. You could hedge other factors, maybe make the hedge size adaptive. Right. The article hinted at future directions, like dynamic hedging based on market conditions, maybe combining it with other risk tools like volatility targeting. Exactly. It lays a foundation. So that wraps up our deep dive into this specific example of beta hedging from the material you sent over. We saw how reducing that market exposure helps isolate alpha, but also saw that potential trade-off with the slight increase in drawdown, possibly from the implementation itself. Yeah, and maybe a final thought for you to consider, based purely on these results. When hedging away market risk leads to the measured alpha increasing and the model's explanatory power R squared decreasing so drastically. What does that really tell us about the challenge and maybe the importance of trying to generate performance that's genuinely independent of the market? It makes you question what skill versus luck or factor exposure really looks like. It really does. A lot to think about there. Well, thank you for sharing these sources with us. My pleasure. Always interesting stuff. And thank you for joining us for this deep dive.